Hello, my name is Maj Milton Amulo, and I'm here to talk about my math paper called On a Fair Multiflow Problem. So let's start with introducing networks. And if you're thinking of a network, you're probably thinking of something like this, or some um, social network, something with all these different connections and wires and such, or maybe roads or all these things. And we'd like to have a nice mathematical picture of what a network should be. So what do we want? We want to show direct and indirect connections. It's important to be able to say that you can get from one place to another without going through somewhere else. And it's also important to describe going from one place to another through somewhere else. We'd also like to show the strength of a connection. Not all roads are equal. You can have a 10 lane highway or a two lane to Wisty Turney back street. Some of them can carry more stuff on them than others. And that's the way you should think about the strength or capacity of the connection, is how much stuff it can carry over time. And we also want to have directionality. There's stuff like one-way roads, but there's also stuff like when one side of a road gets filled, the other side isn't necessarily full. I'm sure if you drive or have been driven places, you've had the unfortunate thing of looking over at the other side of the highway and seeing everyone's zooming by. We want to have the ability to not just say that this road has this much capacity, but how much the capacity is being used in each direction. There are some networks where there just straight isn't directionality on sidewalks. If there's a bunch of people going one way and you're going the other way, you're gonna run into those people. But for a lot of networks, you can separate out the sides that are going one way versus going the other. What we don't want though, is to be overly tied to one kind of real world network. It would be nice if we could do roadway networks, internet networks, if we could get all of those different details into one framework. And here's what it is. So this might look a little strange. We have a bunch of these little circles. They're connected by these arrows and there are these numbers. So let's break through this. Each one of these circles is called a node. And a node you can think of as a point, a point where you can go from one path to another. So I'm at this node, I can go here, or it could go here because these arcs is what they're called because they're pointing in a direction. And how much can go from this node to this node? Well, one thing can, or one unit. Units are arbitrary because we're mathematicians, not engineers. So just say that this one means that one thing can go and well, this three means three things can go. And they go from here to here. They don't go there. They don't go back. If we wanted to show that there was a way to go back, we'd need another arrow pointing in the other direction. These numbers here are the capacity. They're how big the arc is. Some networks of integer capacities, you can just say all of them are one and then I just draw multiple arrows, but it's usually a lot easier to see with just a number next to them. And you can see that I can get from here to here, but I have to go through multiple arts. So I have to go like, mm, 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 or, mm, 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 or any number of other paths. You should be thinking about this sort of thing as networks as ways you can travel. Now I am omitting some details, like for instance, the way I actually drew this network isn't important. What's important is the connections and how strong the connections are. But now we get to the idea of flows, and flows are things on a network. Think of flow as sort of a amorphous moving state. A and, and the like. But really you should think about flows more in terms of this. The movement of people or items or data across any sort of network that makes sense to them. Things go from here to here through a flow. And there are multiple kinds of flows you could have. 
linear flows. You could have things where it's just one node to another to another to another, or you could have ones that branch out and recombine. Often useful to not really think about them as distinct items, but like trends. That's also why they use flows because of stuff like water flows. And you can also have flows that look a little different, like the flows of boxes in this stock photo warehouse. They move, and in general, you can split them up arbitrarily. So now let's go ahead, move on from just talking about flows in the abstract, and start looking at them. So here's our network from before, and we consider this one our starting point, and this one our ending point. So here's a flow. We use green for the source, also called the start. There's some other terminology, but source is the most commonly used one. And then it flows to the blue, the sync, the terminus, the end. I don't tend to use the word terminus, but it's here because T is different from S. I'll often label this S of something and this T of something. And we, we have as the load of the flow or the content. So in this situation, one unit of flow is moving across this arc and it joins with this unit of flow. So we've got one, one, and then we have two that go across there. Note that despite this one having one, this blue number in a box, which is how I'm going to show flows, shows that nothing's flowing across that one. And as we see, two comes in here. It could support three, but only two come in. And you can think about this as sort of a bunch of paths. So you could say this path carries one, and then there's this path, which carries one, and then there's this path, which carries one. But they all add together in this way. So there's a few conditions we have. One of the first ones we should think about is what I call the capacity constraint. And why would we want this kind of constraint? Well, imagine if I wrote a five here and then I added, so this was a six and this was a six. That's according to another rule we'll get to in a bit. If I gave this to someone, they'd be like, uh, there's a problem. This can't support five. This can only support one. It's like, it would be like overloading a bridge. Too many heavy trucks. The bridge is gonna collapse. So we obviously don't want to do anything that's nonsense like that. But what was the other one? Why did I increase these ones as well? Well, it's to satisfy the second one, the conservation constraint. Now, this is a weird looking math expression, but let's break it down. First, this is the flow on an arc. So if I pass it this arc, the function would give me one. If I pass it this arc, the function would give me zero. This one, two, and so on. We can think of the this flow function or the flows load function. We'll get to why I'm using load later, but we could think about this as being a way of asking, hey, how much flows on this? We're often used to learning about functions when they have explicit forms, like let's say g of x equals x squared minus three. As you can see, this is why I don't handwrite everything. But really all you need for a function is to have it be well-defined. If I give you something, what do you get out? So this can be sort of like a lookup table. So if I say uh, f of friend fave number. So if I give you a friend, put them in this function and they get out your favorite number. I'm using friend because that's presumably you know the favorite numbers of your friends. And if you don't, you should maybe ask. But this is a well-defined function for you. I might have a different version of this function because I know different people than you. This is a completely reasonable function. So we can consider that this little f of a is a reasonable function. We give it an arc, it tells us how much flows across it. Now, what about these? Well, a minus of n is all the arcs that go into it. So if I say this is my node, this is, this is n, then these ones are in a minus, and then these ones are in the a plus. So what it's saying is look at all of the arcs in a minus of this node and all of the arcs in a plus of this node 
and make sure they're the same. And as you can see, we get one from here, one from here, and then we give away two from here, give away zero from here. And this is true for all the nodes in this. So I could do this as n, this as n, this as n. All of those work except for two. The source and the sink. And we should think about why that makes sense. Well, it makes sense because if this was true for the source, nothing could leave it. And if that was true for the sink, nothing could enter it. I didn't write that here, but that's something you should keep in mind. We always exclude those from the rule. And we can say, and to simplify, that the first side's the incoming flow, and the other one's the outgoing flow. Not all flows are the same, and we can talk about the idea of uh, the value of the flow and how much stuff it carries. We can also consider it as how much stuff it carries over time, but that will become more important later. So amount goes in one end or out the other. Notice that flows are assumed to have no leaks. There's no flow that enters the source that doesn't leave the sink. So these two are the same. And let's go to the whiteboard. Let's begin with the very, the most basic 